two. We could make it two. Yeah, Friday and Saturday. We could make it three. Thursday, Friday. Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Okay. Uh, let's uh, take our Bibles and turn to Jonah. Jonah chapter 1. Verse 1. Still getting there. Oh. I'll teach you the mnemonic someday. Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nathan, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. And once you know the mnemonic, it's easy. Okay. The Lord, word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying. Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. So he went down to Joppa, found a ship which was going to Tarshish, paid the fare, and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. The Lord hurled a great wind on the sea, and there was a great storm on the sea, so that the ship was about to break up. Then the sailors became afraid, and every man cried to his God, and they threw the cargo which was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone below into the hold of the ship, lain down, and fallen sound asleep. So the captain approached him and said, How is it that you are sleeping? Get up, call on your God. Perhaps your God will be concerned about us so that we will not perish. Each man, to, uh, each man said to his mate, Come, let us cast lots so we may learn on whose account this calamity has struck us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, Tell us now, on whose account has this calamity struck us? What is your occupation, and where do you come from? What is your country? From, from what people are you? And he said to them, I am a Hebrew. I fear the Lord God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men became extremely frightened, and they said to him, How could you do this? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord, because he had told them. So they said to him, What should we do? To you that the sea may be calm for us, for the sea was becoming increasingly stormy. He said to them, Pick me up and throw me into the sea, then the sea will become calm for you, for I know that on account of me this great storm has come upon you. However, the men rowed desperately to return to land, but they could not, for the sea was becoming even stormier against them. Then they called on the Lord and said, We earnestly pray, O Lord, do not let us perish on account of this man's life, and do not put innocent blood on us, for you, O Lord, have done as you pleased. So they picked up Jonah, threw him into the sea, and the sea stopped its raging. Then the men feared the Lord greatly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the stomach of the fish three days and three nights. Go ahead and be seated. So from just our reading today, you can probably tell that uh, our, our passage is about a sea voyage. And it is. One of the, the best written uh, descriptions of an ocean voyage uh, in ancient literature. Uh, almost as good as the Odyssey. Not nearly as long, however. 
But I recommend you read The Odyssey. It's a great book. So, Felix, Festus, Agrippa have all examined Paul, questioned him, questioned him, uh, heard his testimony, and they've all decided that, you know, we really should have let this guy go. Uh, but, you know, we're rulers and we're ruling an unruly people, uh, and they want him dead. Uh, and he's appealed to Caesar, so away he goes. Uh, Festus had a problem. He said, I don't want to send anybody to the emperor without writing down some charges against him, you know, and I don't know what to charge him with. It's going to make me look bad. Uh, evidently, he came up with something because he's, they're sending Paul to Rome to be tried by the emperor. So they must have figured out something they can write uh, as charges against him. But we don't know what those charges are. Our, my title I, I just took from, uh, you know, how your Bible has uh, headings in it. And I probably shouldn't have chosen that. Uh, I just copied and pasted it. And, I uh, probably shouldn't have because this is really not Paul's last journey. But it's his last one for a while. Uh, now, being this is a narrative, a story, I decided not to use a, you know, uh, a word-for-word uh, -word translation. I uh, got this from the J.B. Phillips, which tells the story rather nicely. Luke just is essentially telling us the story of what happened. Starting in verse 1 of chapter 27, it says, As soon as it was decided that we should sail away to Italy, Paul and some other prisoners were put in charge of a centurion named Julius. Turns out he's kind of a nice guy. The centurion, as uh, the name would imply, is a officer in charge of uh, as many as a hundred men, although many uh, of the uh, cohorts were not always full. You know, they would get down to 600 sometimes. So, uh, but he's like uh, you know uh, the platoon captain or something similar. Uh, his name was Julius, and he's of the emperor's own regiment. There were uh, there were legions that were uh, essentially did the will of the Roman Senate, and then there were other legions that uh, were uh, under the command, the direct command of the emperor. And if you know anything of Roman history, sometimes the legions fought each other. You know, uh, uh, Brutus and Cassius went to war against Mark Anthony. But it says, we embarked on a ship sailing, hailing from Adramithium, bound for the Asian, Asian ports, and set sail among our company, oh, and set sail. Among our company was Aristarchus, Aristarchus a Mace Macedonian, uh, from Thessalonica. Now, we also know that Luke was accompanying Paul on board this just because Luke is telling the story and he quite often refers to we, although he doesn't name himself. Uh, but this Aristarchus is named a couple of times in, uh, uh, in the scripture. In Acts 19, 20, uh, 29, it says, the city was filled with the confusion and they rushed with one accord into the theater, dragging along Gaius and Aristarchus, Paul's traveling companions from Macedonia. In the book of Colossians, Paul refers to Aristarchus as his fellow prisoner. So when they got to Rome, evidently Aristarchus was 
imprisoned along with Paul. It says, on the following day we put in at Sidon. So from Caesarea to Sidon took one day. And uh, let's see, uh, we put in at Sidon where Julius treated Paul most considerately by allowing him to visit his friends and accept their hospitality. So Paul gets off, off the ship and is uh, able to uh, uh, visit with some, uh, some fellow believers in uh, in sight. Let's, let's look at the next slide. Next, there we go. Mike, so, you skipped a couple. Actually. What? You skipped a couple of slides. Did I? Do you want us to just stay here? Well, so, go ahead and show me the ones I skipped. Not that one. I read that one. Read that one. No, nope. no, we got them all. Okay, um, so they start out here. Can everybody see the red dot? Uh, they start out here at Caesarea, and they make Sidon in one day. And Paul gets out and he goes and visits uh, some fellow believers. And then it says, uh, go ahead to the next one. Okay. From Sidon we put to sea again and sailed to leeward of Cyprus, since the wind was against us. Then we, uh, when we had crossed the gulf that lies off the coasts of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we ri arrived in Myra in Lycia. There the centurion found an Alexandrian ship bound for Italy and put us aboard her. So let's look at the next, uh, we've got another map. So we start, uh, whoops, what did I do? I shouldn't have pushed that. Let's see. There, there we go. Yeah, I forgot that this can control. Uh, so anyway, uh, Sidon. Uh, and then we go uh, to the lee side of Cyprus. The lee side, you know, there's the lee side, and the other side is the, who knows? Windward. Windward. That's right. So the wind is coming this way. So we can tell that from the narrative. So uh, it goes around Cyprus, comes over here to Myra. Is that where they found the ship? What's that? The, ship, the, Alexandria. the Alexandria ship. Evidently, this was a fairly small ship, and it says they're going to, uh, it's on its way to the ports of Asia. So, this area here that we call Turkey today was uh, the, the eastern, or the, I'm sorry, the western part of it was referred to as Asia or Asia Minor. Uh, but the centurion found an Alexandrian ship. Uh, uh, bound for Italy and put us aboard her. Uh, there were regular grain shipments from Egypt to Rome. This was uh, part of the, uh, the demand that the Roman Empire put upon uh, Egypt uh, was to supply wheat for pretty much the entire Roman Empire. Uh, evidently they were not real good uh, at raising a lot of wheat uh, anywhere in in Europe, so they did. They just got it from uh, from Egypt. And it says, for several days we beat slowly up to windward, and only just succeeded in arriving at Canidus. Uh, let's see. S uh, then, since the wind was still blowing against us, we sailed under the lee of Crete and rounded Cape Salmon, uh, or, or Salmone, or however that's pronounced. Uh, coasting along with difficulty, we came to a place called Fair Havens, near which is the city of Lasea. We had by now lost a great deal of time, and sailing had already become dangerous as it was so late in the year. And we have another map here. So with a lot of difficulty, they get over here to Canidus. Okay, 
uh, the wind was still blowing against us. The wind is coming from uh, from the west, uh, and we sailed in the lee of Crete. So this would be the, uh, the the lee side of Crete over in here, uh, and uh, around it, uh, the Cape of uh, let's see, we don't see that on the map. Uh, let's see. We came to a place called Fair Havens, which would be right there near La Silla, right there. And we had by now lost a great deal of time, and sailing had already become dangerous as it was so late in the year. So Paul warned them and said, go ahead to the next one. Paul warned them and said, men, I can see that this voyage is likely to result in damage and considerable loss, not only to ship and cargo, but even of our lives as well. Now, Paul is speaking his uh, opinion as a uh, seasoned traveler. He kind of uh, has been on these waters before, and he knows that uh, after uh, a certain time in the fall, you don't, uh, you just don't go out. Um, If we we're reading a literal translation, it would tell us about uh, that it was past the fast. You know, and we should all know what the fast is. When, when do, in the fall do Jews fast? Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. So Paul is telling us it's past that. Uh, it's uh, later in the fall than the Feast of Yom Kippur. Uh, but it says that Julius paid more attention to the helmsman and the captain than to Paul's words of warning. Moreover, since the harbor is unsuitable for a ship to winter in, the majority were in favor of setting sail again in the hope of reaching Phoenix and wintering there. Everybody knows it's better to, win to winter in Phoenix, right? <laughs> We, it's interesting, we, we, we know the site of Phoenix. Uh, for a long time it was kind of unknown, but uh, in, in recent years they have found the site. And uh, so far no serious uh, archaeology has been done there. They have found a few inscriptions dating from the time. Uh, the the uh, Turks at a certain point uh, during the, the uh, uh, Ottoman Empire built a fort there and of course you know what uh, they do when they build a, a fort is they take all of the building materials all the stones from whatever was there previously to build it uh, so any of the uh, uh, buildings from uh, Phoenix and I think we've got a picture don't we Isn't there a picture of Phoenix um, just the, probably the next slide oh, oh there uh, one more. Here we go. So this is the harbor at Phoenix, and as you can see, it's a fairly uh, close-in harbor, and would be a good place to to weather out uh, a winter. But, but go back one. So anyway, Julius trusts the experts. Now remember that the Titanic was built and operated by experts. <laughs> the ark was built and operated by, by amateurs. Oh, that's true. No, it's by God. Right. So the experts are quite often wrong. Quite often. But it says that Phoenix is a harbor in Crete facing southwest and northwest. So when a moderate breeze sprang up, thinking they had obtained just what they wanted, uh, the, you know, the winds are good, let's go. They weighed anchor and coasted along, hugging the shores of Crete. But before long, a terrific gale, which they call a northeaster, swept down upon us from the land. The ship was caught by it, and since she could not be brought up into the wind, we had to let her fall off and run before it. So when, uh, when tacking a sailboat, uh, if the wind gets uh, too rough, well, you can't do it. You know, tacking is going at an angle to the wind, so you can actually go into the wind. It takes a long time. You have to travel uh, 
you know, you have to go this way and then this way and the back and forth uh, to make any headway. Uh, but if the wind gets too strong, uh, it will just turn you around or, or turn you over if you're trying to tack into the wind. And that's what uh, it's saying here. Uh, the ship was caught by it and since she could not be brought up into the wind, we had to let her fall off and run before it. So uh, they turn around and just go uh, east as the wind is, that's the way the wind is blowing. It says then running under the lee of a small island called Clada, we managed with some difficulty to secure the ship's boat. Generally in those days, the ship's boat, which uh, would be used for a lifeboat or if you had to anchor out uh, in the sea and you needed to, you know, have transportation into the land. And of course, nowadays the the uh, ship's boats are are put on brackets and kind of uh, set on deck. But in those days, they just towed it behind. And it says, uh, after uh, we managed with some difficulty to secure the ship's boat, after hoisting it aboard, they used cables to brace the ship. So they hoist the uh, boat on board and then they take uh, heavy ropes and run them underneath the uh, hull of the ship in order to, because they're afraid if they don't it's uh, it's going to fall apart so they're holding the, holding the thing together with with ropes one of the amazing things I've seen uh, is some of the ships from those days were actually tied together with with pieces of rope, or they would call it uh, sewing. They would take the planks and drill holes in them, and then put rope through the holes, and, you know, and kind of stitch the whole thing together. Uh, but it actually worked fairly well because when the rope got wet, it swelled and it filled the holes. Uh, so the planks actually uh, were held together fairly securely. Uh, but they would use additional rope around the entire hull. Now this is a big ship. It tells us uh, that uh, it holds uh, uh, 275 persons. Uh, it was a big cargo ship. Probably some something uh, uh, like 400 feet long and uh, 75 feet wide. Good sized ship. Uh, they used cables to brace the ship and to add to the difficulties, they were afraid all the time of drifting onto the Sirtis banks or reefs that they knew were in the area. So they shortened sail and lay to drifting. Go to the next one. So this is kind of this area in here. I mean, this is just back and forth. We don't really know exactly where they were. Uh, and they didn't know either. Uh, but they did make some headway because they got over to here. Uh, it says, uh, the next day, as we were still at the mercy of the violent storm, they began to throw cargo overboard. On the third day, with their own hands, they threw the ship's tackle over the side. Any extra rope, extra sails, extra uh, wood, uh, they tossed it out. And then, when for many days there was no glimpse of sun or stars, and we were still in the grip of the gale, all hope of our being saved was given up. It says nobody had eaten for some time. When Paul came forward among the men and said, Men, you should have listened to me and not set sail from Crete and suffered this damage and loss. However, now I beg you to keep up your spirits for no one's life is going to be lost, though we shall lose the ship. Now previously, Paul was speaking as uh, uh, an informed traveler. He knew the waters. Now he's speaking because he's got specific information. He says, I know this because last night the angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood by me and said, Have no fear, Paul. You must stand before Caesar. And God 
as a mark of his favor towards you, has granted you the lives of those who are sailing with you. Take courage then, men, for I believe God, and I am certain that everything will happen exactly as I have been told. But we shall have to run the ship ashore on some island. So on the 14th night of the storm, as we were drifting in the Adriatic about midnight, the sailors sensed that we were nearing land. Indeed, when they sounded, they found 20 fathoms. That's about 120 feet. Now, sounding was done uh, pretty much the same way through most of history with a piece of cord with a lead weight on it uh, with knots every six feet. So each knot was 20 fathoms. Or, I'm sorry, each knot was a fathom, six feet. They were probably measuring in cubits, but so it would be a little more. Uh, and then after sailing on only a little way, they sounded again and found 15 fathoms, or about 90 feet. So the water is getting shallower. So for fear that we might be hurled on the rocks, they threw out four anchors from the stern and prayed for daylight. And of course, there's been stories recently, uh, mainly coming from Bob Carnuk, uh, saying that they had found the anchors. Uh, they may or may not be Paul's anchors, but they're similar. I think we have a picture. Uh, no? Okay. Sure. It's almost certain I put a picture in there. Okay. Uh, they're just a, uh, an iron anchor that uh, just looks like a kind of a bow uh, with a hole in the middle. Uh, and, and the stem of the anchor, which nowadays they're, they're made of iron, uh, was actually made of wood. Uh, but, the, but the prongs of the anchor were iron. And they have found several anchors in that area, whether they're from Paul's ship or not. There's no really way to tell, but they found them at approximately the right depth and in the right place. Uh, the sailors wanted to desert the ship, and they far, got as far as letting down a boat into the sea. They were just going to, you know, they were going to take off and leave everybody to their fate, you know. Let them figure out how to sail the ship. Uh, pretending that they were going to run out anchors from the bow. But Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, unless these men stay aboard the ship, there is no hope of your being saved. You know? uh, we need people who know how to operate a ship. At this, the soldiers cut the ropes of the boat and let her fall away. Uh, the uh, centurion took command of the situation and just said, uh, uh, those ropes that they're using, cut them loose. Then while everyone waited for the day to break, Paul urged them to take some food, saying, for a fortnight now you've had no food. You haven't had a bite while well, you've been on watch. Now take some food, I beg you. You need it for your own well-being, for not a hair of anyone's head will be lost. And when he had said this, he took some bread, and after Thanking God before them all, he broke it and began to eat. This raised everybody's spirits, and they began to take food themselves. There were about 276 of us all told aboard that ship. And when they had eaten enough, they lightened the ship by throwing the grain over the side. This was their main cargo. They had also had other stuff that people had, uh, you know, said, uh, you know, had, had uh, uh, when they put into port, there'd be uh, somebody there, uh, you know, a, a freight uh, forwarder who would say, oh, you're going to Rome, well, would you, would you take this, you know? So they had already thrown all that overboard. And now the main cargo of grain that they were taking to Rome, they threw over. Probably quite a few tons of, of grain. But it says, when daylight came, no one recognized the land. But they made out a bay with a sandy shore where they planned to beach the ship if they could. So they cut away the anchors 
and left them in the sea, and at the same time cut the ropes which held the steering oars. Then they hoisted the foresail to catch the wind and made for the beach. So they, uh, because in the, in the storm, the uh, storm wind can uh, catch the sails and tear them apart, or they can tip the ship over uh, if enough force is applied. So they taken down uh, the sails, but now they put up a sail because they want as much wind as they can, as much speed as they can to get up onto that beach. Uh, so go ahead to the next one. So we know that what where they are is over here. They've made it to uh, Melita, which today is Malta. So they're heading into, uh, into this beach, it says, but they struck a shoal, a reef, and the ship ran aground. So the ship hits a, a reef, and it says the bow stuck fast while the stern began to break up under the strain. So the bow is held steady, the waves are beating against the stern and breaking it up. The soldiers' plan had been to kill the prisoners in case any of them should try to swim ashore and escape. If they lost their uh, prisoners, that was a capital offense, and they themselves uh, would be executed. But the centurion, in his desire to save Paul, uh, put a stop to this and gave orders that all those who could swim should jump overboard first and get to land, while the rest should follow, some on planks and other on the wreckage of the ship. So it came true that everyone reached the shore in safety. As I said last week, it should have been a movie, and then Pete said, well, it was, but it wasn't a very good one. <laughs> so that's too bad, because that could be a good movie, I think. But we see in the scripture uh, that storms at sea seem to be a, a consideration uh, among the biblical writers. They're, they're impressed by storms at sea. Uh, there's a fear of a storm at sea. Of course, that's a well-founded fear, isn't it? You know, there, are, there are things we should be afraid of in life. We have another account of a storm, much shorter, uh, that happened on the Sea of Galilee. Jesus was teaching somewhere on the Sea of Galilee. And then it says, on that day, when evening come, came, he said to them, let us go over to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him along with them in the boat, just as he was, and other boats were with him. Probably Peter's boat. And there arose a fierce gale of wind, and the waves were breaking over the boat so much that the boat was already filling up. Jesus himself was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? They bring, bring an accusation against him. You don't even care. We're perishing. And he got up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Hush, be still. And the wind died down and it became perfectly calm. And he said to them, Why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? Now, was Jesus admonishing us to uh, never be uh, concerned uh, about storms, you know, hurricanes, tornadoes, firestorms? He said, Do you have no faith? Well, first of all, do you not have any faith in who I am? Haven't you figured that out yet? Do you think that God's plan might not work out? Um, don't you know who I am even now since I, you know, I'm the one who just ordered the wind to be calm? <clears throat> in the case of Jonah, they were all familiar with the story of Jonah, who calmed the sea? Who brought up the storm? God did. Hmm. Could that mean that Jesus is God? 
I think that's the part of the uh, story, part of what we're supposed to understand from the story. Is God's plan in danger of failing? George. In verse 35, he said to them, let's go to the other side. So he gave them, he told them, we're going to the other side. You can't lie. Yeah. So, do, you, do you think we're not going to make it to the other side? <laughs> if I decided we're going to? You know, Jesus wasn't telling us to be foolish. You know, to just be oblivious of the uh, storms around us. But storms are somewhat symbolic of just life in general. I mean, we are all going to experience storms, you know, frequently. Uh, many of us, you know, have been and may again be in tough situations. You know, in the uh, the Tower of London, which is kind of a misnomer because it's actually four towers, but they call it the Tower, uh, <clears throat> which are mainly museums in those four towers today. But in the uh, Tower of London, there is a sword. And it has, uh, it's on display, it has two dents in it. And those dents uh, got there by musket balls hitting it. And the sword was wielded by Oliver Cromwell at uh, the uh, Battle of Drogheda Castle in Ireland. They spent, uh, and, this, and Drogheda Castle was an extremely well-built, strong castle. It took several days of cannon fire uh, to make a breach in the wall. Uh, but when, when the breach was finally opened, Cromwell, uh, raised his sword over his head and uh, led his troops through the breach in the castle wall. Uh, and, and after the battle, some, somebody asked him, one of his officers, saying, you know, you're the uh, de facto uh, ruler of England right now. They had just deposed the king. Uh, a good movie, Cromwell, with... Uh, Let's see, I'm trying to think. Richard, uh, no, not Richard Burton. Oh gosh, Alec Guinness. Uh, Just go on with the story. Anyway, the story. So, somebody asked him, you're, you're the de facto uh, ruler. We deposed the king and you're ruling the country and you're also the military mastermind of the army. We, everything would fall apart without you. Uh, don't you think you ought to be a little more careful? And Cromwell's response was, I'm going to be here not one day uh, longer or shorter than God expects me to be here. And we kind of had a similar situation when we were in Israel. We were with a guy who drives like a maniac. Uh, that, that's Arnold Fruchtenbaum. <laughs> and he had the same attitude. He said, you know, I'm going to, you know, God has a ministry for me and I'm going to be alive to do my ministry uh, until God wants to bring me home. So, uh, you gotta, you got to have faith. <laughs> uh, and they became very much afraid. Jesus' disciples were very much afraid and said to one another, Who is this then that even the wind and the sea obey him? He's the creator. Um, but we all have difficulties in life. We all suffer loss in life. We suffer loss of health. We suffer loss of relationships. Uh, we suffer from death of those who are close to us. And in the midst of that, God says, have faith. Now, like I say, he's not telling us to be foolish. Uh, he's not telling us that he's going to fix all our problems. What he is telling us is that his plan is going to succeed. And we can be a part of his plan. 
we can rest in the knowledge that God's will is being done. And God uses difficulty and loss, tragedy and pain uh, to mold us into the creatures that he wants us to be. You know, suffering comes to everybody. It's not just, uh, you know, some people skate through life and with, you know, no problems. I, I don't know anybody that that uh, happens to. That nobody gets a free ride. Um, but suffering also is, is just how uh, God works. Uh, unfortunately, because that is the result of our uh, fallen nature. But he has suffered himself on our behalf. And we can even say that uh, the majority of the suffering of mankind, fallen mankind, uh, he has taken upon himself. We should, when we're in the midst of suffering, not ask, you know, God, please take this away from me. Although that's legitimate. But the main question I think we should be asking is, God, how does this suffering serve your purpose? Uh, because in some way, we can have faith that it does. Let's pray. Lord, we, uh, we know that there are difficult situations in life um, and we suffer loss financially, we suffer loss uh, physically, uh, we suffer from grief, we suffer uh, uh, from loss of health. And Lord, we know that this is the, uh, the result of sin. Not individual sins uh, so much as just uh, sin and suffering are loose in the world. And Lord, we just pray that you would uh, grant to us uh, the ability uh, to understand and have faith that uh, this suffering, uh, <clears throat> well, not necessarily being brought uh, uh, to us. Uh, it happens to the believer and the unbeliever alike. But this uh, suffering will achieve your purposes. Lord, we just pray that you would give us that faith. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.